<clears throat> Welcome, and uh, we'll start, of course, with our bracha. Baruch Ata Adonai Eloheinu, Melech HaOlam, Asher Kitshanu B'mitzvotav V'tzivanu L'asot B'direi Torah. And here we are with the very last parsha of the Torah, Vezot HaBracha. This is the this is the blessing right over here. And again, just like last week, which was written in poetry, in a poetic form, this also is written in a poetic form. And that always creates uh, greater challenges in terms of understanding and interpretation, uh, sometimes because of the syntax of the Hebrew, sometimes because of the vocabulary being used, uh, either way, uh, or obviously because it's speaking metaphorically, uh, but this is always uh, a challenge to try to understand exactly what is being said here, what, is, what the sense is. But it is, there's a parallel here between the fact that the book of Deuteronomy ends with this blessing, with Moses blessing the tribes, and the book of Genesis, which ends with Jacob blessing his sons. So there is that parallel between the two, the two moments here. And that we should end with blessing is so important. So we'll we'll get started right into the into the text. The Zot Habracha, this is the blessing, Asher Beirech Moshe, which Moses blessed. And before I get to that, I should say Moshe Isha Elohim, Moses, the man of God, right? Blessed at Bnei Israel, the children of Israel, Lifne Moto, before his death. And, of course, Rashi jumps out and says, what is the necessity for these two words, lifnei morto? Why, why, what is it adding to the sentence? Because the whole point is it could have read, you know, this is the blessing which Moses blessed the children of Israel, period. And then go on. What's, what's the purpose of those two words? So we're going to take a look. So, the zot habracha. So that's just a reference to what the Parsha that he's referring to. He's not actually commenting on these words. Here are the words he's commenting on. Lefnei morto, samuch lemitato, close to his death, close to his departure. And this, of course, is taken from the Sifrei. Remember, we've made lots of references to the Sifrei, which is a halachic midrash on numbers and Deuteronomy. She'im lo achshav, and here's the point, if he wasn't going to do it now, now achshav, Ematai. When was he going to do it? He had to do it at this moment. This was his last opportunity. So that's what it's just trying to tell us, that this was the very last opportunity for Moses to bless the Jewish people. Going on to the next verse. Give me one second. I just want to make sure. i hearing some ambient sounds. That's the reason. Here we go. Vayomar. And he said, Hashem misinai ba. So again, we see that the syntax is is not regular syntax because what it really to translate this literally word by word it says he said the Lord from Sinai came. So you can already see that the shifting of the of the verb and the nouns you know already makes it gives it a certain poetic tone to it, right? So the Lord from Sinai came, the Zarach Meseir Lamor, and Shan from Seir to them. Now, Lamo is also a poetic form of the word Lahem. It may be a more ancient form of it, but Lamo is definitely a poetic form of to them. Okay? Came, and he shone from Seir to them. Hophia, he appeared, Mehar Paran, from Mount Paran. The Atta, and he came, me rivervot. Now it sounds because these me and me and me up here, me say ear, me sinai, you might think that it means from, that that's a, a, um, a preposition. Rashi explains that this is not a me meaning from, but me rivervot, okay, uh, means f- some of came with some of the myriads, Rivava is, is 10,000, a myriad, Kadesh, so Kodesh, Kodesh, holy myriads, and came, so this is the way Rashi is going to translate it, and came 
with holy myriads. Mimi no, from his right hand, Eish dat lamo. So the note here says that we're supposed to read this as Eish dat, right? A fiery Eish, fire, dat law to them. A fiery law to them. Lamo, there's that word, lamo again. So we'll take a look at the Rashi and then we'll take a look at the Torah Tamima this morning. So let's take a look here where it starts, where the Rashi starts. Here we go. Vayom Hashem Misinai Ba, right? He said that then, and he said, the Lord from Sinai came. And again in the Sifre, right? This is Ibid Sham there. Patach Trila Beshiv Chosha Machom. So he began, first of all, with praise of the Holy One, of God. V'acharkach, and after that, patach b'tzorchehem b'shel Yisrael. And after that, he began with the needs of the Jewish people of Israel. U'veshevach shepatach bo, and with the praise with which he began, in other words, in praising God, yesh bo haskarat zechut Yisrael. There is, within that praise of God, there is a mention of the merit of the Jewish people. And he says, all of this, all of this introduction is by means of appeasement. That in other words, he is, here we go, he'll explain what kind of appeasement he's talking about. Flormar, that is to say, ki daihem elu, that these ones are worthy Hey, they are, these ones are worthy, shetachul alehem bracha, that the blessing should come upon them, that the blessing should fall upon them. So, that they were worthy of the blessing. That's what, that's what the opening is trying to say, is that before he actually tries to specify a blessing, that in fact they are indeed worthy of such a blessing. Misinai ba, from Sinai came. Yatsa likratam, he, this is God, went to greet them. Kesheba'u lehit yatsev betachtit ha'ar. When they came to stand at the bottom, at the foot of the mountain. Kechatan, just like a groom, a bridegroom, hayotze lehakbil pnei kala, who goes out to greet the bride. Shinet, so that you have this picture of God coming that, that, the, that Mount Sinai and the giving of the Ten Commandments. We, you may already be familiar with this, that it's compared to the grand wedding of the Jewish people to God, and that God was the groom and Israel was the bride, and that God came out just like a bridegroom to greet his bride. Shinemar, how does he know this? Because it states in Exodus chapter 19, Likrat HaElohim, to greet the God. Excuse me, one. What happened? Okay. Thank you. Lamadnu, so we learn from this because it says Likrat HaElohim, Lamadnu Sheyatsa Kenegdam. So because it says likrat, right, to, to welcome, something like that, before God, we learn from this that he, that God, went out uh, to, in, to meet them, kenegdam. V'zarach meseir lamo, and he shone from seir upon them, or to them. And this again is from the Sifre, and you may be familiar with this somewhat famous Midrash, Shepatach livne asav, because initially he he approached the children of Israel, of Esau of Esau, sheyikablu et haTorah, that they should accept the Torah. He offered the Torah to the descendants of Esau, the Loratzu, but they declined. They didn't want it. Hofia, that is, he appeared lahem to them, mehar paran from uh, Mount of uh, Paran. And this is an example of Shehalach Sham, that is that God went there, went there, Upatach Livnei Yishmael, 
and he offered it to the children of Yishmael, Shi'i Kabluhu, that they should accept the Torah, the Lord Ratsu, but they did not desire to accept the Torah. The Atta, and he came, the Israel, now he came to the Jewish people. And here, Me Rivervot Kodesh. And it sounds like it's a place, okay, but it isn't. He s- says, he explains it, the Emo, and with him, that is with God, Miktsat, a few, Rivervot Malachai Kodesh, of the myriads of, of the holy angels. The Lokulam, not all of them, the Lorubam, nor the majority of them, the Lor Kederich, and not in the manner of uh, Basar Vadam, uh, human beings, mortals, Shemar E Kol Kavod Oshro, because people, human beings, tend to show everything they've got, all the all of the of their uh, of their wealth. Okay, that a, that a human being tends to show his entire wealth, the Tifarto and his glory, the Yom Chupato on the day of his wedding. So apparently that is a day when, you know, typically at a wedding where you sort of have lavish, you know, lavish uh, receptions, etc. And that's when you show and you spend all your money and stuff like that. And that's a human way. But with God, it is a little bit more modest. Aish dot, remember, it's one word here, but it's it's supposed to be understood as two words. Shahaitak tuva me'az, okay, lefanav, because originally it was written before him, that is before God, be'esh shchora, with black fire, al gabe esh levana, on white fire. So that's clearly metaphoric, and and it is interesting. I mean, that's sort of something to wonder exactly what is this metaphor trying to tell us, right? So uh, we have to consider what is fire metaphoric, uh, what's a metaphor for. So, I mean, clearly fire burns, but fire also transforms. That's essentially what fire does. It, it creates a reaction of some kind. And um, I think also that fire is so powerful, too. Uh, And I think that that's perhaps some of the idea of just how powerful the Torah really is. Natan lahem beluchot, okay? So he gave it to them, the Ten Commandments, right? Beluchot ketav yad yimino. He gave it to them with the tablets, which with his hand of his right hand. The, the, the script of his right hand. So, you know, in some ways it's saying that the Torah is almost, it's so powerful, hard to, hard to be able to absorb, just like fire is just so hard to absorb, and yet God gave it to them with his own personal uh, autograph, right? The Ten Commandments. Davar Acher, a different interpretation. Esh dat, he says this word, you know, fiery law. Ke, uh, I think this is ke, uh, hmm, it's hard, obviously, this is very difficult. To more, uh, I think it's ke targumo, believe it or not. I think he's saying like the targum, like the Aramaic translation. Shinat na lahem, that he gave it to them, mish, mitoch, from from the midst of a fire. And of course, if you go back to Exodus and read back there in Exodus chapters 19 and 20, which is about the giving of the Ten Commandments, you you read about how the mountain was ablaze and stuff like that. So again, you know, and again, if, if fire is transformative, then there's a fabulous metaphor as to how transforming Torah is, that, tra- that fire can actually transform transform your life. So it, I'm, you know, I'm in a sense going out on a limb here, but at least playing around. And I think one's supposed to do this. That is, in fact, what what we want you to do is to, in your own mind, play around with these concepts and and see what you come up with. So, we'll take a quick look at the Torah Tamima here. Vizarach Miseir. He's going to 
uh, of course now uh, riff on that famous midrash about how God offered the Torah to other nations. Okay, and he's, he's going to explain why, what's the point of that midrash. Uchativ the Hofia Mahar Paran, and in addition, it, it's written and appeared from Mount Paran. Ma ba'a, ma ba'e besa'ir, uma ba'a ba'e, excuse me, befaran. What's it trying to say, right? What's the need to mention se'ir, and what's the need to mention paran? What's the point? What is the point? Amar Rabbi Yochanan, said Rabbi Yochanan, Melame, this teaches Shehechazira Hakadosh Baruch Hu La Torah Al Kol Uma V'Lashon that the Holy One, blessed be He, um, offered the Torah to every nation, every lang- and every language. V'Lo Kibluha, but they did not accept it. Ad Shebali Israel V'Kibluha until He came to the Jewish people and they accepted the Torah. So we'll go. I'll go ahead and. Okay. Uh, yeah, Golda, you should just speak up. I saw your note. I think it's lovely. So Golda said the maybe the fire metaphor is got to do with a spark of knowledge. If I'm quoting you correctly, Golda. Yep. I was just thinking, you know, that aha moment. You know, yeah. where you. Mm-hmm. Yep. Right. Nice. Or what I wrote in my notes was knowledge from fire, but that doesn't make as much sense as what I just wrote to you. So I'm going to erase that, fix it. (laughs) Yeah, I also honestly like, of course, the fact that fire is transforming, that it's essentially used to create transformation. So, anyway, always. Yeah, go ahead. Isn't that what happened at the uh, at Sinai? Uh, He came down in thunder and fire, and the mountains moved. And the people prayed, uh, please, Moses, we don't want to have God. To, uh, we're so scared. Uh, so Moses uh, said, OK. And God was, uh, you know, said, OK, you, through Moses, you can, you know, we'll, we'll transform everything. But then again, uh, what I can't understand, Rabbi, is Ishmael and Esau. 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 Didn't accept the, the Torah. Well, they were Jewish. Why did they accept? Okay, so they so there's there's the point is that they're not mm. Jewish. But give us a chance. I think uh, I I hope that you'll find that uh, you know the that uh, the Torah Tamima is going to explain your your concern very well. All right, so yeah. let's let's t- let's dig into it and see what it has to say. So he says, Seir he eretz Esav. He says Seir is the land of Esau. As is clarified in the book of Genesis. Ufaran and Paran, he erits Ishmael. And Paran is a reference to the land of Ishmael. As is written in the Parsha of Lech Lecha, back in Genesis. Paran. And she dwelt, this is Hagar, referring to Hagar now. And of course, Hagar was Ishmael's mother. So Ishmael, of course, was with her. She dwelt in the wilderness of Paran. Ve'yesh leha'ir, and one can note, she'patach bishte umot, that he begins with these two nations, ve'siem, and he ends, this is Rabbi Yochanan, ends, she'chazar al kol uma v'lashon, that in fact, he started with these two specific nations, and then he offered the Torah to every single nation, every other nation. The Ein Lomar, okay, and, and you can't say, De makor kol ha'umot hem me'esav Yishmael. And you can't say that all the other nations were descendant from, you know, that their source was Esau and Ishmael. They're, they come from different, different places. So that's that's not the reason he offered it to Esau and Ishmael is because they were the ultimate sources of every other nation. That's not the reason. The Imkain, because if that were the case, Lo hava le lomar shechazar al kol uma v'lashon. Because if in fact Esau and Ishmael were the source of all the other nations, he wouldn't have to mention any other nations. They're the source. If he gives it to them, then he's given it to all of them anyway. So you wouldn't need to say that he had to go after, he had to go and offer it to every uh, 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 nation and tongue. Ella al Esav Ishmael, just Esau and Ishmael, that would have been enough. The Gam Be'emet, 
And in fact, truthfully, Harbe Umot Haim, Levat Esav Ishmael, there are lots of other nations apart from Esau and Ishmael. Kagon Amon, like Amon, Umoav and Moav, the Iyen Besifrei Khan. And he says, check it out in the Sifrei in reference to this particular verse. Rabbi, why, why does the people say that we're the chosen people? Uh, I, I, we're not the chosen people. We accepted the Torah. The other nations didn't. I try to tell people that, but they still think we're, we're the chosen people and they're jealous of us. I don't get it. <laughs> well, I, I don't know how seriously people take that kind of thing these days anyway, whether they're Jews or non-Jews, okay? Um, ge generally speaking, I mean, this concept of chosenness is definitely comes from the Bible, comes from the Torah. Uh, and, and, you know, there's this famous statement, I can't think of who said, I don't know if it was G.K. Chesterton, who, who once said, how odd of God to choose the Jews. And then the response is, it wasn't odd, the Jews chose God. So, you know, again, my understanding, if there's any merit to this idea of chosenness, it's responsibility. It just simply says that Jews have a greater responsibility in terms of how they relate to the transcendent and the, and the infinite and recognizing the, the broadest concepts of what makes life significant in this world as human beings. And that, that in our tradition we have that. But the truth is I, I feel there's such tremendous value to, to you know, other religions as well. And I've learned from those other religions to the extent that I'm familiar to, to some, you know, uh, with those other religions. And my sense is that, it, that, that Judaism is the one I was invited to do, you know, to, to try to practice and to try to understand. And clearly within Judaism, there is so much tremendous value. And it is absolutely incredible. But, um, you know, it's this little statement, chosenness, carries with it a lot of other ideas, you know, that are worth thinking about. But it doesn't necessarily mean privileged. And usually people think of chosenness as meaning privileged. And I, I'm not saying they aren't privileged. If there's a privilege, it's the fact that we do have this Torah to study, which is so profound and, and has so much to it and adds so much value to life. But I see the need to be grateful, you know, to have a tremendous amount of appreciation for the fact that we have this material, not because we're so much better. In fact, that kind of stuff is stated quite clearly in Deuteronomy, but it gives us, it does give us the responsibility that goes along with this particular gift. So let me keep going, if I may. I, with, can, I say, can I say just one thing? Of course, go ahead. Um, there is still a prejudice that is prevalent today and i've experienced it several times and i know that other people think these things that we think we are the chosen people we are elitists and we set ourselves apart from others and so harlan that is what i heard you say and i want you to know that it is still true today and those kinds of judgments from misperceptions by not studying what it is really about those kinds of misperceptions can create prejudice okay. absolutely yeah no thanks lisa i appreciate really do appreciate what you just said yeah i agree anyway. and there's also the lumping of all the all the different sects and movements into one big mm -hmm. blob of ultra orthodox right. just like we like like people do with people yeah. who are, are of arab descent and right. may or may not be muslims or may or may not be yes ultra orthodox muslims yes it's golda it's that mysterious they quote exactly quote. yes let me keep going if i may the Yeshlomar, and one could say, the Ein Hachinami, okay, the the Bevadai. All right, so you know, I'm trying to think. So Hachinami generally means, uh, oh, it, that that it should in fact be just Esav and Yishmael, and we shouldn't mention the others. Okay, that's that's my understanding of this particular expression here. 
In other words, sometimes hachinami, this this expression hachinami, is is a, a way of argumentation by saying, you know, you raise an objection, right? That in the argument, an objection is raised, and the on, the response is, yeah, let's accept the objection and see where that takes us, right? So, or in, in fact, you're right. That's that's in fact what it really means, you know. When it depends on the nature of the objection, right? So it's it's a, it's a a way of argumenting, you know, of ar arguing out something. So I'm saying I think that what he's saying here is that um, that you can't you you shouldn't say well they should have just mentioned Esau and Ishmael, right? And that's you know they mention it here, and that's all they meant. Right? They didn't mean the other nations as well. Okay. That, that the other nations weren't off of the Torah. So you can't say that. Why? Because clearly, clearly, that in fact, God did offer the Torah to all the nations. And why do we say that? Here's the reason. So that they wouldn't be able to argue afterwards. Why wasn't it offered to them? In other words, if the Jewish people were so uh, privileged to get the Torah, you know, you know, and that's why they are able to perform the divine will in, in this sort of perfected way, trying to perfect the divine will. Well, they say, well, if we'd been offered the Torah, we'd be doing even better. We do better than the Jewish people. And for that reason, God had offered it initially to them, and they had rejected it. Now, what he doesn't tell you here is that in the Midrash itself, it tells you, and this is, to me, a very profound moment in the Midrash. Let, let me get to this place anyway. So, okay. Kemivu Arba Gemara, as is as explained in the Gemara, that the reason why God offered the Torah to all the other nations before he offered it to Israel, to the Jewish people, was to give them the opportunity uh, to do it, and the fact that they rejected it to begin, they rejected it out of hand, uh, and, and the Jewish people did accept it, well, that's why they're the chosen people. Because essentially they chose to accept it. Ella shenir mezuba Torah. Okay, but the fact is that is implied in the Torah. Rak alesav Yishmael. The reason why the Torah only alludes to Yishmael and Esau. She yesh lahem yachas el ha Torah yoter misha'ar haomot because they have a relationship to the Torah more than the other nations. Because they were direct descendants of Abraham. And that's the only reason why they are mentioned specifically. The fact of the matter is that God did offer it to all the other nations, and the Torah just explicitly, ex, uh, explicitly states those two because, of course, you know, Ishmael was a son of Abraham and Esau was a son of Isaac, meaning they all had a direct relationship to Abraham. And that's why. So clearly he has more to say here, and what I'll do is I'll start here tomorrow. But let me tell you what my sense is. Um, so the Midrash says that uh, the, what happened was that when God offered the Torah to Ishmael, Ishmael said to God, well, what's written in it, right? What's written in it? And God said, well, it says thou shalt not kill. And the Ishmaelites said, well, we can't accept it because we have, we were told, by our sword we shall live and we're going to live by our swords. We are going to do that. We are going to commit murder and we are going to involve ourselves in killing. So we can't accept the Torah. And then when God ex offered it to, um, e to Esau, I, if I'm not mistaken, I think he, they asked Esau again, said, well, what's written in it? And uh, God said, well, it says you shall not commit adultery. And Esau said, well, I'm sorry, uh, that's just the way we do things. We are, you know, free livers, and that's what we want, and we're going to accept it. So my sense of the Course is this, that there's a very profound statement being said here about wh whether or not one accepts the Torah. And, of course, we all have, right? There are cultural norms, and there are cultural behaviors, and, and if you put those cultural behaviors before the Torah, in front of the Torah, then you're not going to accept the Torah. 
And that's really what this Midrash is saying that makes it very contemporary. So to what degree are we willing to allow the Torah to dictate to us and to say to us what our values are to be as opposed to our cultural values and where we put them in front of the Torah. So with that I'm going to, I'm going to end uh, the lesson today uh, and welcome your comments before I uh, turn off. I'm going to stop the share and uh, give you a chance to comment well, a little bit before I This is recording. sort of off the subject, but you brought it up. Uh, thou shalt not kill. Yes. Uh, I always remind people that it's really murder because... Correct. Right. And the same thing with stealing. I say, no, that means kidnapping. Right. Uh, it's a stealing a person, not right. a thing. Right. 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 It, and that and may have been, by the way, the e sort of thing. Confused with that. Well, why is that a you know a big a big deal thing? Because a person is changed right. forever after that. That person is never the same after being kidnapped. If you right, which so, I got yes. from Pearl Barrow a thousand years ago. <laughs> right. No, that's great. No, the reason why is because they they look at the Ten Commandments and say that those are all uh, capital offenses. Right. So stealing is not a capital offense unless we're talking about stealing a person. Correct. That's a capital offense. And that's how they understand thou shalt not steal as meaning thou shalt not kidnap. Right. That's, yeah. Yes, that's right. That's how I, I try to tell that, re, remind right. people outside the community and sometimes inside the community. Uh, when, I, when I teach, when I was teaching, I always right. make sure that that was... You know, it's not like, you know, stealing a pencil. It's not the same. Right. You know? Well, but even so, it doesn't mean that stealing pencils is okay. Lisa, no, did you of course something? not. But it's a different yeah. type of offense. Right. It's, of it's down in there with coveting. It's not a capital. Kind of, right. Yeah. <laughs> Lisa, did you uh, want to... Rabbi, oh, yep, religion, sorry. The other religions accept the Ten Commandments. I wonder how many yeah. accepted the Ten They do. They do. Oh, I okay. think that many other religions do actually accept the Ten Commandments. Lisa, did you want to say something? I'm sorry. I know you were trying to. I thought you were that's trying okay. to say something. That's okay. When I really want to get in there, I just keep talking <laughs> <laughs> and going. Remember every once in a while, I go, wait, wait. <laughs> so, um, yeah, um, I love the spirited discussion. But I'm learning so much because, Golda, I did not know that. It's perfect because yes, it, it is still a person not to just yes shall not steal. yes there's, there's so much guilt put on people for misunderstanding certain laws right yes. well because they're not always taught things correctly and the people who are teaching them may not have been taught correctly right that, so I, there's generations of misinformation i'm a, i'm a product of of that exact type of teaching and learning so i turned away from it and you know didn't didn't spend right. much time in school when i was younger let's just put it that way well you don't get into this part until you get to me post bar bat mitzvah you really can't until the kids can really understand it uh so a lot of people tend to drop out before uh -huh. you get to the good stuff uh -huh. is sex, drugs, and rock and roll. You know, that's what I, is kind of how I would teach that. And the real story of Hanukkah and a lot of other things. Like, this is the stuff they don't, you don't know. And it's good stuff. Yeah. You know, just can't get to it. Let yeah. me stop the recording and just thank those who have been following us to this point. So. <laughs>